Hey everybody and welcome back to another video here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Hope everybody's having a good day. Uh, spring is upon us. Spring has sprung. Um, today we're going to be talking about normal saline or 0.9% saline, an incredibly common intravenous fluid. It's going to be part of our normal saline. Sorry, let's mute our computer. That'd be a good start, huh? Get the brightness up, all those good things. Great. Um, it's going to be part of our intravenous fluid series. We'll link the playlist containing all those videos uh, in this video's description. We're also going to be uploading the study guide to this video and practice questions onto our Patreon page. We'll link that in this video's description, too. We'd love for you to check it out. We're trying to build up our Patreon community. There's free membership as well as tiered membership. So whatever you're interested and capable of, uh, we'd love to get kind of more people uh, part of that community so we can grow that. Uh, today in this video, we're going to be talking about what normal saline is, its clinical uses, acid base effects, including that hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Some contraindications, cautions, common myths, clinical pearls, so all good stuff. Uh, the hope is that you come out of this video knowing kind of the solid foundational basics on all things normal saline. No further ado, quick 30 second break for introduction. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hey everybody and welcome to Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking out the video. Here at Whiteboard Medicine, our goal is to create medical education content for all types of interested learners. That includes videos, practice questions, study resources, and much more. We would love for you to join our community by subscribing. Hit that bell button. We're also working to build a high yield Patreon page. It's going to be full of practice questions, video outlines, notes, commercial free content, and much more. None of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on. All right, thanks for sticking around. So normal saline. Uh, normal saline is one of the most used IV fluids in clinical settings. Uh, this is starting to change a little bit, uh, which we'll get into uh, later on in the video. Um, but it's commonly assumed to be kind of this benign one-size-fits-all, just give them some fluids. But there's a lot more beneath the surface. There's things we have to be aware of, uh, precautions, uh, other fluids that we should think about. This is not a benign thing. Uh, we always tell our trainees, you know, intravenous fluids, IVF, is a medication. And as such, we should think about it like a medication. We should think about indications, contraindications, complications, all that kind of stuff. So what is normal saline? <clears throat> Excuse us. Well, a normal saline is a 0.9% sodium chloride solution. That's where we get kind of the 0.9%. And it is a crystalloid fluid. And if this isn't familiar to you, we actually put out a video. It's linked in that playlist, intravenous fluids, that looked at, ooh, we spelled wrong, crystalloid versus colloid. Uh, crystalloid fluid is normal saline, lactated ringers, plasmolite, all those. And normal saline, as we said, is a crystalloid fluid. It's composed of sodium and chloride, right? NaCl, salt, for all intents and purposes. And we call it normal, but interestingly enough, it is not really normal at all. It has about 154 milliequivalents of sodium and 154 milliequivalents of chloride. And in the blood, sodium, 135 to 145 is normal, milliequivalents for sodium. So it has more sodium and more chloride than is physiologic, okay? So it is not necessarily normal as compared to the serum. It has higher concentrations of sodium and chloride um, than the blood does. In addition to that, the osmolarity of sodium chloride is about 308 milliosms per liter. And this is a little bit hypertonic, all right? So tonicity is the... Um, if you have a cell membrane, tonicity is the solute concentration on either side of the membrane that then causes water to flow from low solute to high solute. So hypertonic would be high solute, right? So uh, water would flow towards hypertonic solutions across a cell membrane. Um, and you can see the physiologic human uh, osmolarity is about 285 to 295, whereas this quote-unquote normal saline is about 308. So it's not only supra-physiologic amounts of sodium, of chloride, but it's also hypertonic. And this is related to the supra-physiologic amounts of sodium and chloride, because what's the biggest things that lead to tonicity? Salt, sodium chloride. So the fact that there's higher concentrations in normal saline than in the plasma is what leads to it being hypertonic, hyperosmolar compared to the serum. So, oh look, we even put that in there. We forgot we put this little nice, uh, normal saline is not truly normal. It contains more chloride 
and more sodium than the plasma, which we just talked about. So why is this important? Why is this relevant? Well, we're going to go over here to a little graphic. And this graphic is something that we covered, and it looks at fluid compartments. Okay? So fluid compartments in the body involve the intracellular space, the extracellular space. And within the extracellular space outside of cells, there's the intravascular inside blood vessels and extravascular outside blood vessels, like the interstitial fluid. And these compartments are separated by cell membrane, right, for intracellular versus extracellular. And this is then driven by tonicity, right, because it has to cross a cell membrane. So normal, sa normal uh, saline, sodium chloride salt, as we said, is hyper tonic. Okay? So it has tonicity. So if we're separating the extracellular fluid compartment from the intracellular fluid compartment by a cell membrane, that's what this purple line will be. And if this is confusing, check out that other video linked in the intravenous fluid uh, video playlist in this video's description because we go into it in detail. But if this is the cell membrane between intracellular space and extracellular space, sodium chloride does not readily cross this membrane because it is hypertonic, okay? It has tonicity. So it does not, the fluid does not cross, does not cross into the intracellular space. So it just stays in the extracellular space. But the intravascular and extravascular space are just uh, separated by the blood vessel wall. And things can cross freely through there. So normal saline does cross freely between the intravascular and extravascular space. So if you were to have an IV in a vein and you were to give one liter of normal saline, this is a vein, this is capillary, right? And then this is going to be the artery, A for artery, V for vein. And you're giving fluid, and I, we the blood travels from the arterial arteries into the arterioles, into the capillaries, into the veins, venules, uh, sorry, into the venules, into the veins. Um, so if you're giving fluid to the body, travels around to the arteries, um, you want to know how much is actually going to stay in the blood vessel, intravascular, versus going to the interstitium, right? All this space kind of outside the blood vessels, the interstitial space. And normal saline travels freely across here. So it's going to travel out into the interstitium freely, and it's going to equilibrate. And what we know is that within the extracellular space, one-fourth or 25% is intravascular, and three-fourths or 75% is extravascular. So this one liter of normal saline, only about 250 cc's will stay inside the blood vessels, and 750 cc's will travel into the extravascular space or the interstitium. All right, so just to give you some context about how much is staying in the blood vessels versus how much is going out. But as we said, none of that travels to the intracellular space, uh, so it all stays extracellular, at least initially. All right, clinical uses of normal saline. What are some common indications? Well, the common indications tend to be similar to just common indications for fluid in general. Hypovolemia, or shock. It depends on the shock state, right? So septic shock most often needs fluids hypovolemic shock most often needs fluids, whereas other shock states, such as obstructive shock, things like pulmonary embolism, tamponade tension pneumothorax, usually need some fluids to a degree, but you can also get too much fluids. And then cardiogenic shock, which is when your pump, your heart is not working, does not need fluids. So hypovolemia and shock from things like sepsis or from hypovolemia or obstructive shock, uh, initial resuscitation uh, with normal saline. Now, we personally our fans of lactated ringers. This is not meant to be medical advice. This is all opinion and education. We're fans of lactated ringers, LR. Um, but you can use normal saline. And there's been lots of studies on this, and some studies seem to slightly benefit lactated ringers, especially for things like renal dysfunction. But then other studies show equ equivalency uh, in some populations. Uh, so LR, normal saline. But hypovolemia, dehydration, or ECX, that's extracellular fluid loss. Lots of vomiting, diarrhea, burns. When you start to... Um, uh, uh, break, I guess is a word, the skin barrier. By burning the skin, you lose lots of fluids. Um, medication dilution, a lot, lots of meds are uh, in normal saline, uh, so it's compatible with a lot of IV meds. Hyponatremia, and this is an interesting one, right? So if you have low sodium in the body, normal saline does have, what do we say, 154 milliequivalents, 
Oop, that's a Q equivalence of sodium. So you can use normal saline to increase your sodium, but there's a lot more to this story, and it probably needs its own video. Sometimes you want normal saline, sometimes you might want 3% saline rather than 0.9%. Sometimes you don't want any of that. Um, so a little more caveat here, but yeah, a solution to think about. And then uh, operative fluids, uh, again, maintenance, replacement. Uh, this is a world that we don't tend to live in, but it is a common thing that is discussed. Uh, important reminder is normal saline does not provide calories, so it is not for nutrition at all. There is no caloric value to it. It also doesn't have a buffer. Some, uh, which we'll talk about, like lactated ringers and plasmolite, has a buffer solution. Normal saline does not have a buffer. And there's no other electrolytes other than sodium and chloride, right? There's no pot potassium, magnesium, calcium. Uh, it is just sodium and just chloride. All right, acid-base effects. This is a really important one with uh, normal saline, and this is why some people will favor other crystalloids, like lactated ringers or plasmolite, like we've talked about. Um, because normal saline, given it does not have a buffer and given it has high concentrations of sodium and high concentrations of chloride, what can happen is you can get this hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Okay, so why it happens, normal saline contains more chloride than the plasma. Excess chloride reduces bicarbonate uh, through this pathway in the kidneys, renal compensation. All right, and then this leads to a loss of bicarbonate and a non anion get metabolic acidosis. Right, so you get hyperchloremia, and that hyperchloremia leads to bicarbonate, HCO3, bicarbonate losses, which then leads to a NAGMA, non anion get metabolic acidosis. All right, and normal saline in large volumes does lead to this. You will see it. Um, so if someone has a nagma, think about what fluids they might have received, and this could be a possible culprit once you've ruled out other things. Right, so large volume resuscitation can cause acidosis. Some studies show increased risk of acute kidney injury and poor outcomes uh, in the normal saline group as compared to what's referred to as balanced crystalloids. Right, and balanced crystalloids are things like lactated ringers and plasmolite which we'll be talking about in future videos. So be careful in patients who are acidotic, right? Normal saline, given the high amounts, 154 will be a broken record. But if you get pimped on this in the hospital, you'll know it. 154 milliequivalents of sodium and chloride can lead to this acidosis. So you gotta be really careful with that. Contraindications and caution. Using caution with those with hypernatremia. Again, 154 milliequivalents of sodium. Um, this is higher than the normal serum concentration. So you gotta be a little worried if someone is hypernatremic, giving them a bunch of sodium. Now, with that being said, when someone is hypernatremic, uh, some mixed literature on this, again, another video, um, but you know, you don't want to drop the sodium super quickly. So honestly, depending on what the sodium is, sometimes sodium chloride is an okay crystalloid for hypernatremia. It just depends on what you're trying to do. Hyperchloremia, definitely normal saline will aggra uh, aggravate that acid-base balance. Remember that non anion get metabolic acidosis, nagma um, from hyperchloremia. Renal impairment, uh, this is where they found in some studies that normal saline might be inferior, might be worse than lactated ringers, but it wasn't consistent across all studies. But in someone who uh, has renal impairment, so you just got to be careful. Um, again, that acidosis uh, heart failure and cirrhosis, this is true of all crystalloid fluids. Um, you don't want to give someone who is fluid overloaded fluid. Uh, obviously, not all patients with a history of heart failure are fluid overloaded, depending on what's going on, but many of them are. So you just want to be careful in anybody who has risk of fluid overload. And then metabolic acidosis, we talked about broken record here, magma. Alternatives are lactated ringers and plasmolite. We're going to be talking about each of these in future videos. So they'll be linked in that intravenous fluid um, playlist. So subscribe, hit the bell button, check out that playlist, uh, and you'll be able to see those. Common myths about normal saline. Myth number one, normal saline, oh, it's physiologic. Well, false, right? We talked about how the plasma chloride is 100 to 110 milliequivalents, and in normal saline, it's 154. Same thing with sodium, 154. So this is not a physiologic fluid, it is not a balanced, you'll hear that phrase, balanced crystalloid. 
Uh, it is not a balanced crystalloid. It has supra-physiologic amounts of sodium and chloride. Myth number two, it is safe for all patients. Context is everything. Overuse can lead to complications or incorrect um, scenarios where you use it can lead to complications. So this is a medication, okay? And we should think about it like a medication. We shouldn't just be, you know, quote unquote, willy nilly throwing a normal saline at everybody. Uh, myth number three is balanced solutions are always better. We've been talking about lactated ringers and plasmalite, all these balanced solutions, but that's not always better. Uh, even if you are a subscriber to the literature that suggests balanced fluids are, are better in many situations, but normal saline is preferred in brain injured patients. Uh, because it does have that higher osmolarity and in brain-injured patients. Uh, you don't want lower osmolarity, things that might contribute to cerebral edema. Uh, hyponatremia, normal saline, is often better, but this is still kind of caveat, caveated, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and then some people in the operative uh, setting enjoy it too, although we don't do surgery, so that's a little outside of our area of expertise. So if we were to summarize what we have learned thus far, a normal saline is 0.9% sodium chloride. What is it? Sodium and chloride, 154 milliequivalents, 154 milliequivalents. All right, watch for acid base and electrolyte disturbances. Always assess clinical context. Uh, this is good for volume resuscitation, but long-term fluid therapy, especially with that risk of hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, not always perfect. If we were to summarize it in chart form, uh, as we've mentioned, this is 0.9% sodium chloride. We've talked about the milliequivalents of sodium and chloride. We talked about how it's hypertonic. We talked about the hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis it can cause. Uh, we talked about the indications and then the cautions as well. So hopefully that gives you more insight into this very common intravenous fluid we give. Uh, this is one of many videos we're putting out on intravenous fluids, so definitely check out the playlist, subscribe to the bell button. This whole study guide that we went through will be what's posted on our Patreon page. You can download it, you can do all that kind of stuff, so check it out if you have an interest. Uh, and then we'll be posting practice questions too. Uh, and either way, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.